and it is time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and we will start with listed questions, and I call Ms Michaela Boyle. Question one. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. With uh, your permission, I will answer questions one and two together. Uh, I am pleased that uh, we have announced today the first 23 successful projects that will be funded from the Social Investment Fund. These projects amount to more than £33 million and are from across all nine zones. The list of 23 projects is available from OFM DFM website and officials will also be communicating directly with the organisations involved. The remaining projects that are within the funding allocations are all currently in the economic appraisal process and over the next few weeks and months we anticipate making the remaining announcements fully committing the £80 million fund. Considerable work has been completed in developing the policy and structures, establishing the steering groups and supporting them in the development of their 10 projects for each zone and in getting these projects through the economic appraisal process to this final stage. Most of the individual projects have many elements within them, some with up to 15 different capital elements. Thank you. And before calling uh, Michaela Boyle for a supplementary, could I just inform members that question five has been withdrawn? Michaela Boyle. Margaret, uh, Cam Colia, uh, can I thank the, the Minister for that uh, good news story today? The 23 projects are to be announced, and I'm sure the letters of offer will be going out to those other groups uh, within the coming weeks. But can I further ask the Minister, given the delay in getting funding to those groups, um, that his office will extend the timelines for spend to ensure that we get the maximum outcome from, from these projects? Margaret. Yes, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I'm happy to do that. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I have consistently indicated that we are ring fencing the £80 million. Uh, each of the groups are aware of uh, their allocation, uh, and I think it probably is worthwhile pointing out at this stage that there will be some of the zones that will have uh, fewer schemes in this tranche than others, which only means that they will have more than others when it comes to the, the next uh, and later allocations. Uh, so that we are, rather than holding until we have the last schemes out from the appraisals being carried out by the economists, uh, we now have a sufficient batch through the economists to make uh, this announcement, and hopefully in the next number of weeks we will be able to make further announcements. Thank you. And I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for his responses thus far. And I, too, would welcome uh, this good news story that has been announced today. First Minister, if the projects are announced, can you outline what projects will be funded in my area in the southern zone? Thank you. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, all politics is, is local. Um, however, uh, because it was a withdrawn question, I had looked specifically uh, because they asked me to at the southern zone. Uh, six projects will be funded across the, the zone that incorporates the Upper Van constituency. Uh, amongst these uh, are two revenue projects which will operate on a zone-wide basis with the objective of increasing employment, including £2.7 million pounds for an employment work it project. In addition, there will be four capital projects, three of which are cluster projects uh, encompassing a number of smaller capital works. These will result in 11 capital schemes specifically within the Upper Band constituency including projects to sustain local infrastructure worth £1.25 million. Thank you. And I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the, the First Minister. I have been checking the home page of the departmental website and also clicking on the Social Investment Fund. I see no record of, of the announcement as yet, so uh, I apologise if this scheme is across the line, but I am not aware. Uh, whether it is or not. The First Minister will be aware in the Glen Estate in Newton Ards there was a proposal for a sports facility to be put in place in conjunction with work ongoing uh, in developing Londonderry Primary School, uh, which would have been a very cost effective use of SIF funds. Uh, is he, can he estimate the number of similar uh, missed opportunities if indeed uh, this proposal is not going ahead? Well, I assume the first part of uh, his uh, question was uh, 
congratulations. We are delighted to see the announcement uh, today, uh, and uh, we hope that the scheme will go uh, forward uh, and uh, build capacity within the, the local area, allowing local people to determine what is best for their area. Uh, his criticism of uh, the people in Strangford uh, will no doubt be heard by them. Uh, the issues that uh, well, it is entirely a criticism of the people in Strangford. The member is criticising his own constituents. We did not choose, the, we did not choose the, the schemes. They are locally chosen schemes. They were chosen by the people in the zone after consultation around his constituency. If he is unhappy with that, perhaps rather than the constituents being unhappy with him, which might be the norm, he can now be unhappy with them. I call Mr. Alligatwood. The mass, uh, Mr. Speaker, and that there will be projects that will be funded that are good, and there will be projects that are funded that are not so good. And we'll see where all that goes over the next period of time. But could I ask the uh, First Minister this? Given that he said that uh, over the next weeks and months the funds will be fully committed, are you saying that all these funds will be committed and spent by the end of the 14 or the 15-16 financial year? Or are we going to have a situation where we'll spend, we'll go into the next mandate, which will see this £80 million spend in SIF going over five or six years on timeline? Is that the outcome? Is that satisfactory? Well, first of all, uh, it is a bit sanctimonious of the member to stand to his feet and uh, say, we set up local organisation representative of the political parties that are here, including his own, uh, and that we don't like what they believe is best for their area, because that's effectively what the, the member is saying. Now, we, we may all have judgments as to what might have been the best schemes or the worst schemes in any particular area. That's why, rather than big government consistently taking the position that we will decide for people, this is a project that allowed local communities to decide for themselves what was most needed in their uh, area. Uh, and his criticism isn't a criticism of the scheme, it isn't a criticism of the executive, it is a criticism of people in his local uh, area. Uh, as far as the timescales are, are concerned, uh, the, the funding is allocated, it is ring-fenced. Some of those schemes, particularly the capital schemes, will take longer to roll out uh, than others. Uh, the money is there for whenever the bills come forward, uh, and the, the letters of office, uh, offer will stipulate uh, the conditions which apply. We, we really can't have it both ways. I, I know there has been criticism in the past about the delay that is taken, but you can't criticise the delay on the one hand and then fault us for putting robust procedures uh, in place, and that required more time. But whether it's uh, within this uh, program for government period or indeed the uh, comprehensive spending review period or flows over into the, the next. The money is ring fenced for it. As soon as the projects are completed, they will be funded. I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the, the uh, announcement, uh, even though we haven't seen it. And I would ask the First Minister not to keep me in suspense. And could he uh, uh, relay to the Assembly for my constituency, the, con the Strangford constituency, exactly the same uh, way as he done for the uh, Upper Van constituency? Thank you. Well, I'm delighted that I won't need to because uh, I've just been informed that the SIF press release is now out. Uh, so uh, I hope everybody doesn't vacate the chamber at the one time uh, to go and read it, uh, but it will be uh, available. Again, I do mention to, to members that uh, this is only the first tranche, uh, and there are allocations which uh, I think uh, are a minimum of £8 million for each of the, the zones. That money is ring-fenced for the, the zones, uh, and as soon as the remaining, allocation, or the remaining projects have been uh, assessed, by the economists, uh, we will make those uh, announcements and the letter of offer shall go out. Thank you. And I call Mr. Robin Swan. Question number three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, departments continue to make good progress towards meeting the 20% target. In 2011 2012, year one, we drew down £23 million, and in 2012 13, Year two, we drew down £18.3 million. I can confirm, therefore, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that at the halfway point in the full budget period 2011 to 2015, 
£41.3 million has been drawn down, which represents 64 per cent of the target. We are therefore on track to realise the total drawdown of £64.4 million by the end of March 2015. Figures for 2013-14 will be available after the end of this financial year. We will continue to monitor progress through the All-Party Ministerial Budget Review Group, which I co-chair with the Deputy First Minister, uh, and junior ministers will also continue to encourage departments to deliver against this target through the Barroso, Barroso Task Force Working Group. Thank you. And call Mr Swan for a supplementary. I thank the First Minister for his answer. First Minister, according to some of the research framework programme, sorry, the framework programme for research and technological development, Framework 7, has actually indicated that Northern Ireland has only drawn down 35.33 euro per head, while in the Republic it's actually 590.26 euro per head. Can I ask the First Minister what steps have been put in place to rectify this discrepancy? I assume again, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that was the uh, member, if I can decode him, saying congratulations. It's good to see that uh, not only are we uh, on target, but we are ahead of target uh, in uh, meeting the PFG uh, target figure of a 20 per cent increase. Uh, you do it by precisely the way that the, the executive set out. Uh, you encourage the uh, officials to stretch themselves, work with the uh, arm's length bodies and indeed third parties to enhance the amount of drawdown that uh, we get. In addition to that, uh, through our north-south ministerial meetings, we have talked with the Irish government on ways we can collaborate with them uh, to increase both of our, our drawdown. Uh, and uh, don't forget, we have just come out of a period uh, where we were an objective one area. Uh, we didn't have the same level of uh, competing uh, under the Objective 1 criteria. Uh, so we, we are going through a learning curve and uh, we have uh, already uh, finding ourselves ahead uh, of the targets that we have set uh, and we will continue to, to stretch the officials to, to meet even higher targets. Thank you. And I call Mr Patsy McGlone. Uh, Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and my thanks to the uh, First Minister for his answer up until now. Specifically in regard to research and development, it, it is widely acknowledged and known that the drawdown under FP7 was quite pathetic by comparison to other regions of the EU. Uh, in regard to the uh, Horizon 2020, uh, the Irish Government has set itself a drawdown target of £1.25 billion. Has the minister got any target or <coughs> excuse me, any ambition or target set by his department for a drawdown of Horizon 2020 funding for research and innovation? Well, yes, the, the Irish government's uh, target, of course, takes it through to 2020. We are uh, awaiting uh, a, a paper from DETI setting targets for ourselves. Uh, I hope that those will be ambitious uh, targets. I think if they are not, that the executive would want to, to look at them. Uh, we recognize, of course, that uh, in many cases when we're talking about research and development, we are usually talking about collaboration between universities and, and business. Uh, and we have two universities who uh, are now uh, working very hard, uh, who have, uh, I think, learned how to use the, the system and uh, who are putting in uh, applications which I think will bear fruit in the, the future. So while obviously the executive has an interest and will do everything that it can to assist and collaborate with those who are putting in applications, they are effectively led by those outside of, uh, of, of government. Uh, however, we do want to significantly increase the drawdown that we do get uh, from, from Europe. Uh, I thought at the very beginning that we were setting a very challenging target with the, the 20 per cent. Uh, I am delighted that uh, we are well on track uh, to, to reach that. However, that does not mean that we stop as soon as we reach the 20 per cent. We will continue to push uh, the uh, officials uh, and those who are collaborating with uh, third parties and with arms length bodies to increase beyond that. And of course, we are coming up to the halfway stage, uh, the midterm uh, review, uh, and we will look obviously at targets at that stage to see whether they should be increased. Thank you. And I call Mr. Colin Eastwood. Question number four, please, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. With your permission, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll ask my colleague, uh, Assembly Member and Junior Minister Jonathan Bell, to answer this question. 
Thank you. Yeah. Job creation is one of the key priorities contained with the, within the One Regeneration Plan for the city. And I would also want to emphasize the very challenging economic climate that there has been during this period. The 1,180 jobs that were promoted in 2012-13 are from a whole range of sectors, including construction, information technology, engineering, hospitality. And I think, as a member would expect, there are commercial sensitivities regarding information for some of the organisations and also some of the smaller businesses in the city. I can provide the details on some of the organisations and sectors that are behind the job figures. These include uh, 26 construction jobs during 2012-13 on the Everington site through H&J Martin. In addition, the executive backed the UK City of Culture project, which has resulted in 213 jobs. Invest Northern Ireland promoted 453 jobs, including 200 owned by the US-owned technology firm Allstate, 20 jobs in all-pipe engineering, 11 jobs in Meta Compliance Limited, First Source announced the creation of 100 new posts, 60 new IT jobs were announced by Kainos, 60 through the opening of the Premier Inn, and the new Iceland store created 28 jobs. Some of the jobs promoted and created have been through small business startups and expansions, and I think we'd all want to commend the small businesses that also created jobs in the city during what was a very difficult economic period. And although the economy remains fragile, we are seeing some signs of improvement. A number of very significant events, such as the announcement of 190 jobs in Fujitsu last December, following the First and Deputy First Minister's visit to Japan. Thank you, and I call Mr. Eastwood for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the, the Junior Minister for his answer? Uh, it's useful to have that information. I wonder, could he tell me why, then, in previous written questions that I had asked his department, uh, they refused to give me that information? Well, I, I do happen to have a copy uh, of, of your written answers that, that, that have been given. Um, if you want, I'll read out the answers that you've been given, but which show that uh, the sector indicated that 1,180 jobs were promoted in 2012 and 13. That information was given to Mr. Eastwood on the 17th of December 2013. So I'm not sure either he's not getting the letters or his researchers not telling him it, but that was given to you in December 2013. Thank you. And I call Mr. George Robinson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can the First Minister or the Junior First Minister give a commitment that promotion of the North West will continue to be a priority during First Minister and Deputy First Minister invest investment visits, particularly in light of the very welcome result arising from the Japanese visit to the North West? Yes, I mean, we are we're very much committed. Um, I've undertaken a number of visits, as have the First and Deputy First Ministers, uh, to the area. Uh, I've met in the margins of some of those meetings with Londonderry Chamber of Commerce, I've met with City Council officials, I've met with the economic uh, development officials, and I have to say I'm very encouraged uh, by the can-do attitude uh, that many uh, have taken forward. Um, when we take a list and look down just at, at, at what has been done, from 20 jobs in all pipe engineering to 200 jobs in all state Northern Ireland Limited, the, the 10 jobs Fleming Agri Products Limited, the 11 jobs Meta Compliance Limited, Season Harvest Limited, um, Crystal Clear e-learning organisations, right down to muddle, muddy puddles in childcare. What is very clear is right across the range of sectors, there is an entrepreneurial spirit in the region, and we will do all that we can uh, to encourage that. I notice today, too, that the Financial Times records that uh, Northern Ireland business activity uh, in its monthly rate is at one of its all-time highs, and we want to see that business activity increase. Uh, we want to see some of what appears to be green shoots in our recovery delivering for right across Northern Ireland, north, south, east and west. Thank you. And I call Mr Sammy Wilson. To number six, please, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question too. The Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister has had no discussions 
with the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment on bringing forward a cross-departmental policy on the exploitation of shale gas. Deddy officials are continuing to liaise with the Department of the Environment officials as part of the work of the Shale Gas Regulators Forum. In addition, Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment officials, in conjunction with Department of Environment Planning and Northern Ireland Environment Agency officials, provided the Northern Ireland input to the onshore oil and gas exploration in the United Kingdom regulation and best practice roadmap, which was published by the Department for Energy and Climate Change on the 17th of December 2013. Thank you, and Mr. Wilson for supplementary. I'm disappointed that given the energy problems which we face in Northern Ireland, that this issue hasn't been addressed in a cross-departmental way. But given the fact that at least two executive ministers have vociferously opposed uh, the exploitation of shale gas in Northern Ireland, something which the 42 per cent of consumers who experience fuel poverty and businesses which are struggling with fuel bills will find bewildering. Can he give an assurance that there will be a serious discussion on energy policy, investment policy, planning policy, environmental policy and mineral exploitation policy to ensure that we do not lose out on the opportunity which has transformed the American economy and has got the potential to transfer the North, or transform the Northern Ireland economy. Well, I, I think when two departments are, are, are working together, that is cross-departmental. But it's important that we always follow the evidence and the best practice that there is. Um, I think we've all got a responsibility to be good stewards of the environment, to be good stewards of the earth. And we also have a responsibility to look at international best practice, as the member so rightly points out, at where there can be success, where there can be success in terms of uh, energy security, where there can be success in terms of jobs created, where there can be success in terms of businesses that have their energy costs driven down and therefore can appear more competitive on the international uh, market. It will ultimately be a matter for the Northern Ireland Executive. And I think the Northern Ireland Executive will be judicious as they look at this matter. It will be important to take account of all of the implications that are, are there if we proceed, and the implications that are equally there if we do not proceed uh, with exploiting what is a natural resource. Uh, I think uh, the member made a number of important points towards the end of his question that should undoubtedly be part of those considerations. Um, we should be aware of the best practice in the United States of America. We should be aware and look towards where there is best practice in the rest uh, of our United Kingdom. And we have to judiciously weigh the evidence in a measured way that allows us to be good stewards of the earth that we have inherited and what we want to pass on environmentally to our children and grandchildren, but also that we don't miss out on the huge opportunities that are available to deliver jobs and investment to the people that we serve. Thank you. And I call Mr Phil Flanagan. I get a free last count, and I thank the, the junior minister for his answers. Um, but given the, the questions from the, the previous member, will the junior minister give us his assessment as to whether he believes climate change exists or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I have a degree in science, but it's in psychology, and some would even debate whether that is actually a science or a social science. I think what we have got to do, uh, in all seriousness, uh, is take a look at what there is, to take a look at the best scientific evidence available, to take a look at where there is shale gas exploration on other parts of the world, because we all live in an international uh, marketplace. Uh, jobs, the cost of jobs, the cost of energy will affect what we can provide in terms of employment for our young people uh, and for our own citizens. There are obvious concerns that exist uh, within climate change. And we all have a responsibility to ensure that the environment that we pass on, that we do it responsibly. And we've equally got to take a balanced approach between looking at where there has been international best practice in the area to look at the international science, to see where difficulties exist, 
but equally to see where opportunities exist. And if opportunities are existing to significantly drive down energy costs and thereby allow our people to have more jobs, to have more investment in their area and more money coming into the economy, then we'd be foolish to ignore that on, on an emotional basis. We have to look at it in a measured way, to look at it scientifically and see what we can do for the next generation that are coming after us. We have examples. We can look to the rest of the United Kingdom. We can look to the United States. And where there is best practice and where there is success, we'd be very foolish not to copy that in terms of the United States, in terms of driving down of energy costs. We know the European Union is looking towards uh, energy security as one of its primary aims into the future, and we do well not to ignore those concerns. And I call, uh, I call Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the junior minister so far. Uh, could the minister confirm if there has been any agreements or even discussions uh, about the specific benefits to local communities, such as rate reductions uh, to the local communities where fracking would take place? Well, I mean, where we are in terms of the current position, uh, the preparation for that possible unconventional oil and gas development in Northern Ireland and its regulation. As it stands at the minute, it requires input from several government departments and from several other bodies. Now, the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment has the initial role in terms of the, license, the licensing and the regulation of petroleum exploration. The Department of the Environment would be the principal regulator for shale gas development through its environmental and its planning uh, responsibilities and then the Department of Finance and Personnel, if it's a direct question uh, in relation to rates, would be the best department uh, to answer your specific question. The Shale Gas Regulators Forum was established in 2012. It was a joint initiative by the Enterprise Trade and Investment Minister and the then DOE Minister, Alex Atwood, MLA. Now, it continues to keep the legislative and the regulatory requirements that are needed to support possible development under review. And where it's possible, it will coordinate the functions and facilitate uh, the cooperation. Um, but there has been no direct discussion as yet between the Minister of the Environment and the Minister of Dedi on the development of shale gas in Northern Ireland. However, the Dedi officials are continuing to liaise with the Department of the Environment officials uh, as part of that work that lies within the Shale Gas uh, Regulation Regulators Forum. And Dedi officials, in conjunction with DOE planning and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency officials, uh, are going to provide the Northern Ireland input to the onshore oil and gas exploration in the United Kingdom, the regulation and the best practice roadmap. Thank you. And I call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Speaker, and I welcome the junior minister's statement that uh, we should be looking at the evidence, because all the evidence is that explo exploiting shale gas in Northern Ireland won't bring down gas prices. But uh, where I would agree with where I would agree with Mr. Wilson um, is that this is a deep, deep cross-departmental issue. And does the junior minister agree then that it, it's a bit analogous that um, we have this situation where the dairy minister can issue a license without any consultation? No, I mean, I can't uh, agree uh, with the member, and I think anybody looking at this situation dispassionately and objectively could not concur in a reasonable way that all of the evidence is against, because it quite clearly isn't. And I'm not sure that sort of zero-sum game that he proposes is in the best interests of the environment or in the best interests of energy security are the best interests of fuel poverty, or in the best interests of job creation. And I think the tenor of the member's question uh, would indicate exactly why we do need to have independent and objective evidence. There, I mean, any progress scientifically that has been made has always been met with fears. And I don't dismiss the fears, but they have to be forensically analysed. Uh, there is best practice in other parts of the world. We have to look at what actually occurs there. We are facing a situation in Europe of energy security. 
we are also facing a situation right across the board where all of us in this House want to pass on best practice in the environment and to use best practice in making our decisions. So as I say, what is necessary is a measured judicious response that dispassionately analyzes the evidence for science and compares it against, one, how can we pass on, as a good steward of the earth, a better environment and use best practice from what we inherited? And also, how can we ensure that we follow international best practice, including international best practice that allows us to create jobs, to make energy uh, prices cheaper, that allows us to bring investment into our areas, and allows us to make our businesses competitive on the international stage that they have to perform on? Order, and that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Can, uh, can I ask? Can I, can I ask the Minister, what help can he give to the areas that are not receiving natural gas, and I'm talking about the areas in East Antrim from Larn into the Glens? Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, I'll wait on his supplementary to hear his proposal uh, as to, to what might happen, but uh, I think it does indicate the, uh, the need to use natural resources where they are uh, available. Uh, and uh, I, I therefore expect that uh, he will be teaming up with the member for East Antrim, Mr. Wilson, uh, in calling for the use of uh, shale uh, gas uh, during the course of the, the next number of weeks uh, and months. Uh, of course, where there are facilities available, they need to be used, but uh, particularly in the, the Larne area, there is particular uh, potential for the storage of gas and for the storage of electricity. Uh, two fantastic opportunities that uh, are available, uh, and I hope that that will be supported around this, uh, this House. Uh, and uh, I look forward now to hearing the member's proposal as to what should happen in his area. And Mr. McMullen for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for that. Uh, Minister, what I would uh, uh, ask you to take on board that if we don't uh, do anything about these areas that are not going to get natural gas, we're going to create areas that are, that are going to be black spots for industry. Nobody's going to come in there if we can't compete with other areas that can offer different alternatives to energy. And also, we're going to create more fuel poverty. And this is why I'm asking what can be done by this assembly to look at that there. Uh, I know Lauren has the, the gas uh, storage, etc. But only last week there was one firm pulled out of the gas storage that was under Lauren Loch. Where am I going? Well, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I agree with the, the premise upon which uh, the member is asking this question. Uh, I think there are real risks, uh, not just to, to business and commerce, but also to residential use if we have too high a reliance on very few sources of uh, energy. So I think there is a, a good cause, uh, which I hope that the Deputy Minister and the Deputy committee, committee will consider uh, as to whether they can assist in the further expansion. Uh, of uh, that, that uh, project. Uh, however, at the same time, uh, we cannot, on the one hand, be saying that uh, it's uh, essential that uh, we exploit opportunities that are there and then, with our eyes closed, say, no, we are not going to, to look, even look, at the opportunities for shale gas. Thank you. And I call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And I'd just like to ask the First Minister what his view is on the sectarian intimidation of young school teacher Catherine Seeley uh, recently in the Boys Model School. Well, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I have already spoken on this uh, issue, and my view hasn't changed. Uh, I deplore intimidation yeah. uh, in the workplace, no matter where it takes place and no matter against whom it is directed. People should be getting jobs on the basis of merit. They should be allowed to carry out their uh, employment uh, in a peaceful and dignified uh, way. And of course, there are issues about uh, education. There are issues about the fairness of uh, employment and education. But none of those touch on the issue or justify the intimidation of anybody in the workplace. Thank you, Ms. Katrina Ruan, for supplementary. 
And I'd like to thank the First Minister for that answer. And I just would note, uh, when I was in the department, it was one of the schools that we approved a new build for. And I welcome the work that's going on in the school, but would particularly pay tribute to the young boys who stood up and were counted in tackling sectarianism. My supplementary is there were other uh, attacks that happened, including the attack at a Hochul GA club and also in Bangor. And I wonder, would the First Minister I'd like to give his view on those. Well, I think it's right that we publicly take the opportunity to uh, express our condemnation of any attack on persons and property. Uh, we have had a long history of people trying to threaten and to intimidate. Indeed, a school teacher in Uri was killed uh, over uh, past years. So uh, there is a long history which has to be deplored of people trying to intimidate and impose their way. Uh, on others. So from this executive, let there be a very clear message that intimidation, whether it's by verbal means or by threat of violence or by actual violence, is to be deplored past, present, future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the First Minister will be aware that the closing date has passed for expressions of interest on the Ballykelly site. Uh, can I outline to the House if there has been any indication of the potential of the site? Well, the, the Deputy First Minister and I took the trouble to go down and uh, go around that uh, site, uh, and we were both very substantially impressed, I have to say, by the opportunities that we saw uh, in that facility. And we therefore gave a direction uh, that uh, the, the site was not to be sold because it was for a, a use that would not have uh, developed the site to the potential that the area would have wanted. Uh, I think we have been vindicated uh, as a result of uh, the request for expressions of interest, where over 40 expressions of interest uh, have been uh, created. Uh, they range from uh, those who are only wanting to employ one or two people on the site to those who want to employ thousands on the, the site. Uh, they range uh, in terms of uh, finance to those who want to rent the site, those who want to buy the site, uh, some at uh, very significant amounts of money, some who want joint ventures, some who want uh, for trust to take over and community organisations to have a role. So we have over 40 expressions of interest which will have to be uh, considered very carefully to see whether there uh, are more than one of those uses that could be on the site at the same time, uh, because some of them are only requesting use of part of the site. So I think there's massive opportunity for that northwest uh, area uh, that could be drawn out of this site. It could become a regional hub with very significant employment opportunities. Thank you. Mr. Campbell for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the uh, First Minister's very positive uh, announcement of the numbers of expressions of interest. Uh, can I outline to the House uh, what criteria would be used to maximise the very positive uh, potential uh, of the site. And just on positivity, um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, could I also welcome the very uh, positive approach that the First and Deputy First Minister have taken in relation to the site, much more positive than walking around the corridors of Stormont, counting the number of people who do speak to you and don't speak to you, <laughs> making you look and sound like a real loser. I think I'll respond to the, the first part of that question, if, if the member is content. Uh, I assume uh, what he is uh, recognising is that decisions will have to be taken in terms of uh, the balance between whether we look at that site as a site to create jobs, irrespective of what the income generation might be uh, to, to government, or whether we want to maximise the amount of money we get for the sale of the, the, the site. Uh, I think the, the balance that we have had uh, in, in other sites is to recognise their local importance, to recognise the potential that they can have, how they can change the economy of a local uh, area. Uh, and I am pretty sure that uh, when it comes to, to looking at the criteria, a major factor will be how we can develop that site to be an economic hub for the area as a whole. Thank you. And I call Mr. Fran McCann. Can I ask the First Minister if he believes that we will achieve the targets as set out in the Child Poverty Act? Well, 
I think that all that any executive can do is to continue to push as hard as they can. Uh, obviously, the targets became much more difficult because of the economic recession. Uh, targets in terms of uh, child poverty are related directly to the ability of uh, their, their parents, and that very much comes down to whether people can get jobs. Uh, and as a result of the increase in unemployment uh, since the days when we had 4% unemployment in Northern Ireland, obviously it becomes a much more challenging factor. However, uh, as was indicated by my colleague earlier on, uh, the, the trends are with us in terms of the uh, economy. Uh, it is very clear that unemployment is coming down, the claimant count is coming down. That all indicates that more people are getting into to work and prosperity will therefore uh, increase. Uh, however, I do have some problems uh, with the, the issue of uh, child poverty statistics in that we base them on the medium incomes uh, and therefore we never get rid of child poverty on that uh, basis. Poverty will always be with us if we regard it. Uh, in fact, if you use that criteria, poverty in Northern Ireland is the same as poverty in uh, India. Uh, and anybody that has uh, seen the, the slums in India uh, that uh, the Deputy First Minister and I saw on a recent visit will know that we are dealing with two entirely different situations, but we are not dealing with a world-recognised criteria for poverty. Uh, we, are doing, we are operating on the basis of relative poverty within Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr McCann, for supplementary. I thank the First Minister for his question thus far. But can I ask him that in light of the findings in the OFMTFM Commission Institute of Fiscal Studies report, does he accept that delivering the social change agenda needs to be mainstreamed into all departments if we are going to really tackle child poverty? Well, I am very proud of the delivering social change agenda and the steps that we have taken in it. And it must require the participation of uh, all government departments in trying to uh, achieve its outcomes. The Delivering Social Change uh, agenda, of course, we had a number of uh, initiatives. Uh, when we bring out new proposals, very often they require new infrastructure to be put in place within the, the government system, and that can take some, some time. Uh, so I, I have high hopes that as we move forward, the Delivering Social Change uh, programme will flow out and we can build uh, upon it. Uh, I think the, the member and I are totally in agreement that when young people grow up in this society, they should all have an equal opportunity uh, to be able to progress and to, to move forward. Uh, and uh, it, it must be in the interest of this Assembly to do everything that it can to use that human resource to the best possible uh, advantage and to make sure that every child does have the opportunity that every other child will have. Thank you. And I call Mr. Cahill Boyle. Hey, Gorma, I'll get the brief last time, Corla. Um, Minister, given the recent announcement by Andy Kenny in relation to a formal application we made for a north-south interconnect, could you um, confirm or clarify whether or not your office has received any representation from groups opposed to it? And also, could you give us an update on your office's current thinking on that proposal? Well, I remember discussing the issue with uh, the, the Taoiseach along with uh, the Deputy First uh, Minister. My understanding was, and uh, I will write to the member to, to clarify the, the point, my understanding was that most of the, the problem was in the south rather than in Northern Ireland, uh, and most of it was in relation to whether there were overhead or underground uh, cabling. So uh, I, I will write to the, the member as to whether the department has received uh, any objections. All I can say to them is I am not aware of them. Mr. Boylan, for a supplementary. August pre last call, August going break a session there as up to Ragra. Could I thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and the Minister for his answer. But Minister, given the conflict, conflicting views on this issue, does he believe now that a proper assessment should be carried out on whether or not this project is actually needed to address the energy issues on this island? Well, I don't think there's any question about the, the need for the, the project. That was the one thing that we were all very clear uh, about. Uh, the, the issue, of course, as to how it is uh, implemented goes to the issue of cost, which I understand to be uh, so high in, in terms of uh, underground cabling that uh, it would make the uh, project uh, unfeasible. So I think from that point of view, it is very clear what needs to, to happen, but I, I recognize the rights of people to object because uh, not everybody wants, particularly through their land or close to their property, 
to have the kind of overhead cables that would be necessary. But as I understand it, it is absolutely essential uh, that this project goes ahead. I call Mr Dominic Bradley. Um, can I ask uh, the First Minister uh, if he could give us an update on the implementation of the child care strategy? Well, as I understand it, the, the Deputy First Minister and I have already made uh, our statement uh, announcing the child care strategy. Maybe the, the member wants to, to go along with the uh, member for Strangford and visit the uh, OFM DFM uh, website. But it's a, a project that uh, delivers uh, thousands of, of places in Northern Ireland, uh, which I, I hope will be welcomed throughout the, the community. I'm not sure whether he had any specific question or whether he doubted whether we had the project underway, but it is now up and running. Order, and that uh, brings an end to the, uh, the question time. Uh, we now